That's right, it's an intervention. Uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. All right. Hey, uh, first thing I want to say, before we call this meeting to order, just call me Johnny Cash, right? I read on Facebook that the community wanted to make a statement. They didn't come in here, though. They were outside. They didn't come inside. The statement was they're in mourning over all the tests that our kids have to take. Now, I may not necessarily agree with the solutions that some folks may have, but I do agree that our kids uh, are inundated uh, with these tests, and it has become a bit much, I think, for everybody. And so I wanted to uh, stand in solidarity with those folks. So um, this is a great country. You can, you can speak your mind and say what you need to say. So thank you for doing that. Um, call this meeting to order. The first order of business is, is it Mackay? Did I get that right? I had, to, I had to recruit this young man. He goes to number 12 school. Come on up. And your, cla your cousin, uh, play cousin, going to come up with you. I need for you all to give us uh, your name and uh, tell us what school you go to. OK, my name is Mara, and I'm from school 12. My name is Makai, and I go to school 12. All right, now you all don't know what it took for Makai to come up here. His mom, your mom want to stand up? Stand up. Let's give mom a, a round of applause. Are, are your parents here? Yes. You, you want to have them stand up? M mom or dad or, oh, oh. It's, ah. right, actually stand up, all right. Um, the first order of business when we have these meetings is do the Pledge of Allegiance. We try to uh, shift things around a little bit and these two young people volunteered. Uh, to do it. Now, they, they, are, uh, they are both part, you're both part of the OLA program at number 12, right? Oh, uh, no, I'm just. Who is? <laughs> just you are. Okay. Um, I tried to convince him to do, because this has never been done before that, since I've been here, to do the Pledge of Allegiance in Spanish, because his mom thinks he can do it. Now, he's been saying no, 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 no. But do you think we could try to encourage him to do it? Come on, everybody. <laughs> Malik, didn't you go to uh, 12? Yeah, we used to do Pledge of Spanish. Malik could probably help. Can you help him out? Oh, <laughs> All right, well, let's uh, stand, and uh, you can lead us in the pledge in English or in Spanish. It's up to you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Let's give them a round of applause. We really appreciate that. We ought to see if we can get somebody to do the pledge in Spanish. That would be uh, appropriate. Um, so maybe we can work on that for the next board meeting. Our next uh, order of business is acceptance of the minutes. We have minutes from April the 24th, May the 6th, which was a special meeting, May the 8th, uh, which was also a special meeting. Can I get a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Second. Uh, those minutes have been moved and seconded. Um, next item on the agenda is the I Believe Award. I'm sorry, uh, all those in favor, oh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Commissioner Powell. All those in favor of accepting those minutes, say aye. Aye. Aye, aye the ayes have it. All right. Um, I Believe Award. Uh, come on, come on now. Now, as, as uh, our deputy superintendent comes up to the front, she's going to present the I Believe Award today. I'll give you a little background for those folks who aren't aware of it. If you look at the pictures, how many pictures do we have up now? Three or four? Is it four? Should be four. Um, every other month, we alternate the kind of recognition we give to folks in this community. Uh, and one month, we'll recognize uh, a student. Um, and how we do that is we do that through the I Believe Award. And, and Beverly is going to uh, describe the recipient today. And the student is recognized uh, for his or her excellence. And then what's unique about this is we asked the student prior to coming here today to identify an adult who believed in him or her. So what ends up happening every other month is we recognize not only the student, but the student is empowered and he recognizes or she recognizes an adult in his building. And it could be the cafeteria lady, it could be a teacher, it could be a, a principal, anybody. And we've had a variety of stuff, uh, folks come in here. The following month, we do the Yes We Can Award. Uh, the administration, Dr. Vargas, gives us a school that has shown some, some type of growth, some positive direction, and we recognize the whole school and the Yes We Can Award. But again, this month it is 
that I believe award. Uh, Beverly uh, was kind enough to do this uh, particular award because she happens to know the family of this uh, recipient. Beverly? Um, thank you. It is truly an honor to present to the board and to our Rochester City School District family the student to, to be recognized for our I Believe Award is Unique Fair. I'm going to ask Unique to come up. So I'm going to read it and then I'll tell you why uh, this is kind of emotional for me. But at any rate, much can be said about the leadership qualities of Unique Fair Smith a junior at the World of Inquiry School number 58. Today, Unique is being honored by the board tonight for his recent receipt of the annual Rochester Regent Princeton Prize in Race Relations. Sponsored by Princeton University, the award honors high school students who are working to increase understanding and mutual respect among all races. Rochester is one of the 24 localities across the nation that awards a prize of $1,000 each to each winner and a weekend at Princeton that focuses on racial issues. In the fall of 2014, Unique will be appointed to serve as a student representative to the Board of Education. We welcome Unique and his many talents to this post. Um, this wasn't planned this way, but I happened to be at a meeting at number 58 school. Um, we were talking about some of the issues, and this parent got up and she introduced herself as Sheila Fair. Well, I've been looking for Sheila Fair for years <laughs> because I had Sheila Fair as a seventh grade student. And so after it was all over, I went over to Sheila and I said, Do you know this woman by the name of Miss Kathy or Miss Burrell? I had many different names. That's another story. <laughs> but at any rate, it was Sheila. And we kind of reminisced about our interesting middle school year times. But she has produced a wonderful family, including Unique. And I just want to say to you, Sheila, I am extremely proud of you and your family Sheila, Sheila, did you and Unique. That? So Unique. You have somebody else that you would like to recognize, I believe. Hello, everyone. Uh, Hello. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you for your time. Um, I've been a member of World of Inquiry for 11 years, and I always remember my first day going to the school. When I went there, I was, um, I was a little awkward. At the time, I was a first grader of the year previously, and I was held back. So. We all, so, you know, usually people kind of associate like, oh, you, someone's being held back, they're stupid, this and that. So I was very awkward about my first day. And I remember I went to my, um, I went to Ms. Dixon's class a little early. And I remember while I was um, in the hallway, because I didn't enter yet, um, she was talking to the students and she was talking about how um, Unique Fair, this kid they hadn't met yet, um, he's a student like you, he's very, um, he has things he likes, he has things he dislikes, how he's, um, he's just a regular person. And that uh, ironic. But, um, uh, and that, that was really, that hit me very, um, um, the word, uh, it's just, it was really, it was really powerful to me because it was, um, it was an opportunity to see that I was going to be treated, they were going to accept me as a person. And World of Inquiry has always been that for me. And that was my first experience at World of Inquiry is being treated like another person as a part of a crew and a team and another type of family. So it is, it is an honor to me to give Ms. Dixon this award. She deserves so much more. Mine. 
first and second grade and will be part of the first graduating class of World of Inquiry. I'm so happy to be able to be in his cheering section when I go to your graduation. So it's been so great watching you grow up. Um, you know, if you take the time to do this kind of stuff, you can really see the powerful human connections between people. I mean, Beverly uh, indicated that she had a, a connection with somebody that goes back many years, and now you see these two individuals. Um, and, you know, when we're racing to do these tests and we're racing to the top and trying to do all this stuff, trying to meet state mandates, we can forget how powerful the student-teacher connection can be, and it can span generations. So. Thank you for sharing your story, Beverly. Thank you for doing that today. All right. Um, speakers addressing. Oh, oh, that's right. You guys will always keep me honest. I tell you. Uh, recognition of cross currents. Good evening, good evening to the board and to the superintendent. I'm Sheila Webster, and I do have the privilege and the honor of serving as um, the principal of World of Inquiry. And my reason for being here is to support Unique and also the privilege to honor the rowing community which has been brought to the Rochester City School District. So let me tell you a little bit about this. We often associate crew as being a sport that's reserved for the few. And we have now this wonderful opportunity to collaborate with cross currents. It's okay. We have this amazing opportunity to bring the rowing community and crew to our kids in the Rochester City School District. And that happens when we as a school district and as a, a, a group of community partners such as Cross, Current, Cross Currents Minority Rowing, growing. okay you guys, can I try again? <laughs> All right, Cross Currents Minority Rowing can work in collaboration to bring this unique opportunity to our students. So I'm here to say thank you to Lydia and to the students and to the district for making this opportunity available to all kids. And in addition to that, I want to just have the opportunity to read a statement from Carlos Cato, who was instrumental in helping us to piece this together. And in my reading of this, I want you to consider a thought that always stands with me, and it's about equity, and it's about access, and what community partnerships can do in bridging that opportunity of equity and access for all kids. So this is a statement from Carlos. The goal of the district is to provide our students with a wealth of experiences in all aspects of life. The partnership that has been created between Cross Currents Minority Rowing and the RCSD is one of proven success. Lydia has been instrumental in being a community partner who has provided strong leadership and support in getting this program up and running in the Rochester City School District as well as in the community. The joint efforts from the Department of Health, Physical Education and Athletics and cross currents will continue to strengthen as we look to continue to expand to more schools and begin to develop and implement curriculum through the physical education department. As a, as a district, there are challenges and obstacles we must all overcome through the process. The ultimate goal, however, is to provide our students, their families, and community with a wealth of lifelong learning experiences that are available and accessible right here in their community. The success of this program is a true testament of what can happen when collaboration, communication, persistence, passion, 
commitment, dedication between two organizations between two organizations is 100% focused on doing what's best for our youth and our community. As a department, I will continue to encourage all community organizations with a focus on health, physical education, and athletics to partner with the district so that all of our efforts and resources are maximized and utilized by all stakeholders. I do understand that there are many challenges in bringing stakeholders to the table but we must overcome those challenges to do what's best for our community, especially our youth in Rochester. As a department, we are always looking to expand our students' educational experience through a variety of units, lessons, and athletic opportunities, and it is critical that we connect our school experiences with community resources. We must take advantage of every opportunity to reach our youth and teach our youth the lifelong skills they will need to be productive citizens in today's society. As a district and department, we look forward to not only continuing this great partnership, but establishing many more. And with that statement being read, I want you to consider again the power of bringing community partners to the table and what it can bring to our students. And I would like to now invite all those that are here from the rowing community to come join me here, please. And it's my honor to introduce Lydia who will represent Cross Currents. Look at my family. Uh, when I am not working for the district or at young audiences, I am as close to these young people and my community partners and my coaches as I can be. Um, you have seen slides that show 60-foot boats and these are young people whose families join them to carry them to the water to make sure they know how to swim and to support us in everything that speaks rowing, rowing and growing. I want to thank so many partners, but in particular Commissioner Elliott, who is not here this evening. Uh, she is the fiduciary uh, through Baden Street uh, for Cross Currents Minority Rowing. Uh, Malik has been an incredible supporter, uh, came to the regatta, and we have evidence because photos say everything. And, uh, you know, certainly um, it's a sport that, for which we have a great passion. Couldn't do it without the coaches. Um, Patricia Rosso is uh, self-grown, self-taught, and probably uh, one of three minority coaches in the nation and the first Latina. So we are so proud that we grew rowing in our community and have grown rowing in the hearts and minds of our students and our community. Um, Rich is representing one of the rowing clubs who provides volunteer support and whenever we need a seat, any time, any side, Rich is always there to help out. So I want to thank everybody for taking this time to honor our students who have overcome so many obstacles to be able to enjoy the water, to experience just the spirit and the camaraderie and the team uh, sport of rowing. And uh, I'm, I'm just so excited because I know my next step is my own boathouse. That, that is it. <laughs> That's my agenda. So uh, thank you so much for taking time just to honor um, the students and certainly um, all of the partners who have helped to make rowing possible uh, in the city of Rochester. Um, thank you. Um, what we wanted to do was just to read through the names and the schools so you know actually how many students are involved in the program. Truly, th the superintendent has wanted a citywide program, and as you will see in here, uh, the names actually represent the city and beyond. So we're very proud of what we've accomplished in six years of very, very dedicated work to our youth. Sheila, did you want to read World of Inquiry? And you're going to let me do them all? Well, I need to have those names. <laughs> OK. Uh, World of Inquiry students, Matt Molise, Xavier, 
An ivory. You might have to, have to help me, Patricia. Jair. Jair. Here, you do this. She's the coach. <laughs> Jana. Karina. Kiana. Brianna. Bavon. Henry. Alex. Margie. Irving. Uh, Jaleka. And Patrice. Awesome. From our other schools, uh, from SOTA is Sarah Rule, Casey Shields, Eileen Traver, Alyssa Steger, Meredith Shields. From Urban Suburban Pittsburgh Sutherland is China Stevens, and uh, Urban Suburban Kaori May Stevens. Uh, Ariel Fisher is from Bay Trail in Penfield. Andrew Cole and Isabella Cole are also from Penfield. Uh, Jean uh, Tian, sorry, Tian is from school 12. See, we start them young. Lauren Whitfield is Aquinas, and Jenna Steger is from Wilson IB. So understand that we have a very broad spectrum represented, and we're very excited about uh, what we have been able to do to uh, row and grow together. So again, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you so much for your support. And uh, we gave you each a packet that has articles and more information about these young people and the extraordinary efforts that they have made to uh, make a difference in the rowing community. Thank you. Pay no attention to those people behind the curtain. We have one speaker. Uh, <laughs> we have one speaker uh, sp not addressing an agenda item, but we're going to go ahead and take it out of order. That is Regina Neary. Is Regina Neary here? Did I pronounce that last name correctly? for having us. This is your monthly art gift. So this is what you found at your seats is a yep, print of one of my students, a second grader. His name is Abhishek and I am a teacher at the Children's School of Rochester as well as number 10 Dr. Walter Cooper Academy. So I'm part-time between the two schools and we decided that I would just showcase the one school this time and then another school the other time. Our kids are English language learners all the way pretty much across the board at the children's school. It's like the multicultural hub, if you will. And it's just an important part of their academics, of their learning. They're seeing what they're learning in class, in the art room, in the music room, in the library, in the gym. We're just showing them all the way around visually and through hearing and speaking and doing how to really remember and really learn what this core is trying to teach them. So I just wanted to show you and present to you and thank you for your time and your support. I have some parent supports here too from the children's school as well. Hi, my name is Tina Artman and I'm one of the parents at the children's school. I have a second grader there and a a son in preschool who will be in kindergarten at the children's school. And I just wanted to support Regina and, um, and share that we, at the children's school, we love the arts integrated into the curriculum because we feel that it supports what the children are learning in the classroom and reinforces their lessons. I'm Santosha Quickendall. I'm the mother of a sixth grader at the Children's School. And we also all wanted to thank all of you for your support in terms of restoring the arts to the Children's School and keeping it adequately staffed with vocal music and, and art and library. And so um, 
When we come here this evening, it's not to whine. It's just to, <laughs> to, to, you know, there is no such thing as too much reinforcement of the importance of the arts in, um, in a nation that is increasingly driven by high, test, high stakes testing. Um, time allowing, I may sing Mary Had a Little Lamb to you to illustrate a point that Regina wanted to make, um, which is, that we talk a lot about the importance of vocal music and the importance of children being able to sing and play musical instruments and so forth, but some people are actually tone deaf. And if we are looking to the arts to, as a way to keep children engaged, and if we're looking to the arts as a way to make children feel good about going to school, we also need the visual arts to be represented and to remember that it's not just Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. Mary had a little yeah, lamb, its fleece was away. white as snow. If I... My point is... <laughs> My point is merely that if I that if I had to depend on singing for my self-esteem at school, I would have had none. Thank you. <laughs> Did you want to add something, sir? Say, uh, my name is Polly Ray. I'm the co-chair of the PTO, and, and we support Regina too. And uh, when my son Philip started at the school, they did have a full-time art teacher, and I'm, I'm glad we got everything else restored. So I'm just hoping for that one last thing. Thank you. <laughs> you know, people say thank you, but we thank you for your service. We really do thank you. It, and in fact, Bohan and I were at the we were at the children's school this morning, and very and, good uh, poetry this morning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we read poems to the kids. It was a standing room only. Yeah. And we didn't get the hook. Nobody kicked us off the stage, so it was it was good. All right. Uh, next item on the agenda, Dr. Vargas. Uh, oh, before we do that, uh, let me just say the food that we had back there, those cookies. Ray and I can attest to this. <laughs> those cookies were made by the Edison Caf Cafe. Uh, yeah, they're delicious. Now, when we first did this, we got them from um, Sam's Club. Much, yeah, what? Much more expensive and not as good. So we want to give props to the folks, the students, and the staff at Edison. Those cookies are truly delicious, and I'm hoping that there'll be a few left before this meeting's over. I also noticed on the menu they have uh, sweet potato pies, Malik. Sweet potato pies. Peach. Um, and, and I guess, does anybody know how you, would, how you order this? There's a phone number on here. I assume they're open for business. So is anybody from Edison here? We're, we're going to get some information on this because uh, I assume they're trying to grow a business and, and teach these young kids about entrepreneurship. And I certainly would be a very good customer. So thank you very much to the folks at <laughs> Edison. Um, uh, next item on the agenda, Dr. Vargas. Yep, thank you, President. Why? I'm going to ask uh, Deputy Superintendent uh, Beverly Burrell Moore at the police uh, present to you um, an overview of where we're going with Old City High and also serving a student who need non-traditional high school. You can come to the podium if that's easier, or you can sit in here, whichever you prefer. <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, thank you for this opportunity to address the board um, with me. And my uh, colleague is deputy, excuse me, I'm the deputy, but chief, <laughs> but, but chief um, Amy Shavi, Shavi, right? Did I say it? You did. I, I have to practice on that. At any rate, um, we're here to ask the board or to advise the board that we would like you to consider um, a proposal or a resolution for your June business meeting in, uh, as it ex ex uh, extends to all city high. So just a little history of the program on the Marshall campus. Uh, it was opened in the year 2012-13. Uh, and it was intended to serve those students who needed a diverse, uh, a diverse setting, but more importantly, for those students um, 
who were, on, who were in the uh, phase out schools. Those students tend to be those students who are off track or uh, were at risk of not graduating. So what we would like to do, um, capturing or capt uh, capturing the uh, resolution message of the past is su successful offerings will be expend expanded in current and future years. And that comes from your resolution of March in 2012, I believe. So let's talk about how we can capitalize on the success of all cities. Why don't I ask you, uh, Chief Chavez, to continue? Sure. So, you know, when we look at research and we look at data on what do we know benefits our students and, and what's benefiting our students currently at the All City Campus and the Marshall Campus right now, we know that our students are benefiting from the smaller learning communities. We also know that the innovative and the non-traditional instruction is benefiting our students. Well, how do we know that? Because we know that our overage and our undercredited students were graduating more now through the All City model than we did traditionally in the models at their home districts, and our data is showing that. We know that students benefit from the, the smaller class sizes and in flexible scheduling. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is when we look at individual student schedules and we're able to um, duly enroll them um, and look at specific student needs in a smaller class setting, we know that they benefit from that. And we don't need you know, um, lots of metacognitive studies to tell us that. We know that based on asking our students the questions. Um, we've heard time and time again when we ask students, whether it be at our all city campus or actually in some of our other high schools, what makes a difference? there time and time again, and I know uh, some of our board members have asked that and community members have asked that and members in the schools, they feel a connection. They feel a connection. And um, we also know through, and I don't know if some of you are familiar with Rob Marzano's work, but it talks a lot about what's the number one factor that makes a difference to our students, and it's the teacher factor. And so it's about building those relationships with our students. So also, we hear it time and time again, it's about building a strong relationship and partnership with our families and our community. And I can't tell you how many times I hear that. People want a voice and they want to be heard, okay? Um, and then the facilities and the resources of a large high school campus. So not only about, and because I, I hear this a lot and you know, I'm coming from um, a, a rural school and coming to the city of Rochester, we are so blessed with so many resources but how do we capitalize on those resources and how do we use them strategically? And how do we bring that to a campus where we can support some of our most vulnerable students? So as we look ahead, our proposal to Dr. Vargas and obviously tonight to our Board of Education. So let's talk about that. So one, we're asking that you consider a resolution if Dr. Bar uh, Dr. Vargas accepts our proposal that we continue to expand all city to serve our overage and undercredited students from any of our districts throughout the, uh, any of our schools throughout the district. And we would begin assigning those, those students for the upcoming year, which would include about 280 of those students right now who we know can graduate if we have them in a very specialized program on the Marshall campus for the summer. And as I mentioned before, uh, we ask that you consider this proposal because what we plan to do, or as we look at our non-traditional programming, is to build it in a way that uh, will reduce the number of students who drop out. We want to be flexible so that we meet the needs of our students who often, not only are they overage and or undercredited, but they have uh, challenges in their personal lives that get in the way of school, anything from being young parents themselves, students who have anger management issues, students who feel disconnected from the traditional way of education, students who could appreciate the opportunity to take advantage of online credit recovery, students who need our student support centers that we would organize, um, more consistently and coordinated away on that campus for all students who were there. We want to 
take those students who have attendance that's less than 60% and help them increase their attendance and reason for being there every day because we want to provide not only a flexible program but a flexible schedule. We want to help those students deal with suspensions and often we know those suspensions come about um, because they feel disconnected for some reason or the other. We just want to briefly give you a, a comparison of the student population from all city. Um, right now there are 416 students and we're looking to the future um, with your approval that we can serve anywhere from 600 to 800 students that we have already identified by looking at the gate, their uh, results on the gatekeeper exams, those are the regents exams, the number of credits that they need to accrue, um, 22 of them to be uh, recognized by the state as a candidate for graduation. Uh, we know that those students in a non-traditional setting can take advantage from attending school perhaps from seven or coming in at two and staying to seven at night. Uh, we know some of those students, students need semester classes, some of them need um, full year classes, but the flexibility um, is important. So our next steps that we're proposing with um, Dr. Vargas's approval is to continue our conversations. We did have a meeting in May with the um, stakeholders at All City. Um, I was present for the meeting as well as Dr. Vargas, and we want to continue those conversations as the faculty and if leadership felt very strongly about their success, they felt very strongly that it needs to be a non-traditional program. We need to continue to listen to the voices of our children as they can identify, or our students, I should say young people, young adults, let me not call them children at this point. We need to talk to families about how can we build a program that will engage our kids. We also will continue or begin to have our conversations with approval with the bargaining units, and we will help in, um, we, as you hear, we will be more articulate in our theory of action. A theory of action that to create a non-traditional school that is flexible, that um, provides the supports and programming for kids who are at risk. We believe that all city can make them be, our, uh, uh, can increase our graduate population. So, we would like to submit this proposal to you in June, and we look forward to your thoughtful um, uh, reflections as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Again, this is extremely important that we come to a joint resolution on this, so I appreciate if you have any question, you can direct it to Mrs. Burrell Moore, and, and we will get you an answer. We are looking for the board to give us the go-ahead in our next meeting, I believe it's June 19. Uh, we desperately need it by that time because of the uh, staffing and all the implication and also communication with families as well. Although it's for September, we want family to be well informed. Uh, any questions? Yes, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Um, the first thought that comes to my mind is understanding that um, the, the key to success is student buy-in and building community. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like to know, not today necessarily, but certainly before we are asked to vote on this, um, will the uh, enrollment be uh, voluntary? Will the, the students who fit the descriptors in this be um, invited to transfer voluntarily? And if so, we need to be careful to make sure that they understand it's voluntary. Too often, um, our, our students are told that they're going to move. Um, and then, and that makes it that much harder to get the buy-in that we need uh, and the cooperation that we need. So uh, I guess that's the, the focal point of my concern is how we go about recruiting whether it's voluntary and do the students know it's voluntary? That's a good question. We can give you the answer and the answer I both. This district suffer from one thing and that is that we don't have a traditional educational setting for youngsters that year after year having 
uh, to see in a traditional setting. And what I mean by that, you could have a youngster that arrive in Rochester in November, or perhaps in April, and that child is over age and under credit, and yet we put them in a situation that he or she can know be successful because of the restriction and the lack of flexibility that you have in, 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 a, in a traditional setting. So I look forward, Commissioner Power, to having that discussion. And uh, we are probably the only district that I know this size that, and I'm not talking about what we used to call a job flattening here, I'm talking about a non-traditional and along the line on all city high, which was specifically aiming at meeting the needs of the overage and on the credit student, what that means is that we had youngsters that are 20 years old, that if they're in a setting that they only can achieve seven credits, they will not be able to graduate. But most significant, they might not have the kind of approach that they need. So it's a, it's a complex one. It's not an easy um, task, but we believe that we, as a district, we have to move forward toward our path. Questions? Um, just a, a quick a question, a statement. It would have been uh, better, I think, better practice if this had gone through ESA. I know uh, Commissioner Evans has a lot of work to do at ESA, but the, the, the full vetting of such an important change, I think, would have been preferred. But I do understand what you're talking about, given the time limits, time constraints, teachers have to be ramped up, parents have to be prepared. Uh, but. Um, the question that I had is, have we ever uh, assessed the success of uh, All City High in getting its kids out? Uh, you, you, you had a brilliant idea because that phase in, phase out wasn't working at Franklin, and so it was, it was sort of like a slow death. So you said, let's put everybody in one school that wants to go there um, and give them a, a, a home. And, and I think it's been a home, but my question is, do we know how successful it was in terms of graduating kids? Yeah, but we do know for a fact that by all account, um, the whole city high success rate have been very successful as measured by the population, the challenge that they have. Again, we had a significant number of students that we went looking for them, that they were in our book, but they haven't shown up to school in one, two, or three years. And you and I and Commissioner Adam worked pretty hard in looking at child by child pretty much. And you knew some of the questions you asked about that time. But this child is 19, he has four credit. How is he going to make it? So when you look, the, it gave it a new energy and also provided more resources to students. We also know that about 500 of them, we were not able to reach out because the rescue mission, if you will, was much too late. And what this tried to attempt is to be proactive rather than reactive uh, to an issue that we district across the nation are facing, the overage and on the credit. I mean, if you look at what's happening at East, there's a lot of uh, those young men, particularly young men Correct. of color, who are overage and undercredited, and they're just struggling. In school, uh, they still come to school as a social activity, but they're not making any progress. So I could see how this could have real value. I mean, this is not a school. We've had schools where uh, kids go to be punished. We really haven't had schools until all mm -hmm. City High where kids who are struggling, trying to get on their feet to have a place to go. The, the, the last question I have is, and it should be a quick answer, when a student goes to all City High, do they still graduate from the school that they uh, came from? Or are they mm -hmm. all City High? Graduates. They graduated from that particular school, but all City High had created a community. Yeah. So they had their own graduation. Talking about music, all City High had their own band. We might not like, you know, a little rusty because they just started. But they had a band and they sing and they play sport. And uh, sometimes at 20 years old, is age out or the session five rules. So in a setting like that, they have had those flexibility. Again, we desperately need it as a city to provide that viable, flexible place for a kid to get a, a high school diploma. Commissioner Powell, I saw you leaning towards your mic. Oh, uh, yeah, but uh, Commissioner Cruz, this mic is on also. Uh, yes, i just sort of wondering in terms of, you know, ultimately where, you know, the student ends up. 
with seven credits, it's very difficult to go anywhere with seven credits. However, I'm wondering if any thought has been given to providing other opportunities, whether it's certification in some kind of work area, some kind of um, skill, uh, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, heating and air conditioning, or probably mm -hmm. those kinds of opportunities so that at least you don't lose that energy of that student, A, and B, there's some out outlet for the, the work and effort that they put in, because there's nothing worse for, you know, a student with seven credits and have nowhere else to go other than to graduate with seven credits, you know, to leave with seven credits. But if there is an option there of providing some kind of alternative career pathways, and, and we're doing some more work, and I, I see we're going to be doing some STEM yeah. updating here. Is there some way of marriage, uh, yep. you know, creating a marriage where you have those outlets? And I think that at least gives some student an energy, uh, it gives them some motivation to be able to look at something very, very specific that they can accomplish. That's an excellent question. And part of a strong non-traditional education, we involve hands-on, project-based learning, and also those kind of programs, Commissioner Cruz, that you're talking about. Like if a kid wants to be an electrician or a plumber or uh, um, a chef, that's a way to engage those kids that normally fit that characteristic, the overage and on the credit normally we have failed to engage them in a meaningful way. Now we do know that students uh, facing certain challenges are more, most likely to graduate if they are engaged in hands-on learning, project-based learning, and something that they can see meaning immediately that and also admit the diverse needs. So once again, let me just say tonight, I was going to present to you about our Korean technical education. How do we rebuild it? So, um, I, you know, we have great things in the district, great program as we heard tonight, but we are rebuilding our arts, our music, our sport, our career technical education, our non-traditional program. The list goes on. And I will tell you that we me or without me, please don't lose touch that you're rebuilding a district for arts, for music, for um, um, our AP classes, our IB program. So there is an enormous uh, task in here, Hang, and we, we just need to stay the course, to stay in that trajectory. And um, I will say in the, in the very near future will be the day I put to answer your question, then I will conclude that we are taking, and thanks to this board, we are taking action that we, we don't have the capacity at this moment that we are looking into sending a student to BOCES program. Uh, for example, um, Marshall is not too far from expensive port, and we have to take a proactive action so that we don't wait like what happened at East, where now we are required to send our student to BOCES. But excellent question, and that had to be part of the long-term view of this effort. I, I was just, just going to say, Mr. President, um, so uh, being this was, this was uh, you asked for approval for this at the community meeting. Correct. Um, maybe I, we, have a, we have our agenda set for the next GSA meeting, but maybe I, we can set aside some time on the agenda for yeah. anyone else that may have um, questions or any questions that may come up in yeah. between now and the June business meeting, we can put that, obviously, Great. add this to our agenda. Thank you. We appreciate that you're doing that, and we will prepare you a report and come before you commit it. Um, thank you. Yes. Um, this is sort of tangential to what uh, was presented, but it just happened that in our last policy committee meeting, I noticed that uh, the policy um, um, pathways policy that was advanced by Dr. Janey some many years ago that proposed, you know, three-year three, three year graduation, four-year graduation, five-year graduation, and programs uh, tailored to the student. And as we know, that's not well integrated with the state's vision of how our young people should graduate. So it would be very helpful if in the, in, in part in the context of of your exploration of all city, that we open up that policy and, and ask the administration to weigh in on whether that policy has merit and, and has legal standing given SED's um, position on these issues. 
uh, whether that policy should be revoked altogether or whether there's something in it that we can, that, it, that the administration would like to see uh, survive into the future. No, no. Thanks. Okay, um, let's move on to standing committee reports. Before I do that, Commissioner Campos got an email from somebody that said students from SOTA were going to be here. Mm -hmm. Are you guys here? I thought I saw some. Why are you guys here? Just to observe? The pig class. Mike Condello from School of the Arts is here with his Participating in government? Okay. Why don't you guys stand up? I'll give you a round of applause. How, how many seniors are back there? All right. All you going to college or getting jobs, I hope? All right. <laughs> What's that? All right, all right, congratulations. All right, I'm very proud of you. Thanks for coming out. I hope you learned something. I hope we're, we're, we're educating you on something about government. Um, all right, uh, next thing is we give uh, standing committee reports. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Campbell. For, uh, um, Commissioner Powell? Uh, yes. Okay, the Finance Committee met on uh, Thursday, May 15th. Um, we discussed um, resolutions 664 through 667, I'm sorry, 671, uh, all of them facilities and uh, are advancing all of them to the board for, uh, with our recommendation for approval. We also uh, reviewed the April 2014 financial reports and at this time I move that the full board uh, receive those reports. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We also reviewed the quarterly change order report for the period of January through March 2014. At this time, I move that the full board uh, approve the change order report and the change in the um, final payment. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And finally, we reviewed the third quarter student activity funds report, and I'd like for to move that the full board receive that report. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you so much. Um, our next finance committee meeting will be Thursday, June 12th. We are first in the queue to start at 5.30 p.m. Um, on related topics, the city is having a public budget hearing, uh, which includes the city school board's budget on June, uh, June 11th at 5.30, and they will be meeting to adopt the, the budget on Tuesday, June 17th. That concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Evans? Thank you. Um, uh, first off, let me congratulate again y Unique uh, Fair. I'm looking forward to him joining the board. I've been watching his progress as he's been a young guy. <coughs> Um, let me uh, say first off, uh, the board members should have got, should be getting, I asked um, the, uh, the um, Ray G. Martino and Beverly Burrell Moore who presented at the ESA committee meeting a list of all the summer school offerings, uh, summer programming that we have for the district and um, I mean it is an extensive list. Uh, this has every single um, summer school offering at every single school, the time that it starts, the time that, it's in, that, that it ends. And we literally have thousands of kids that are going to be um, taking advantage of some great, um, unique program uh, that, that's going to be taking place. There's AIS programs, um, newcomer programs, Freedom School. I mean, there's tons of opportunities. Innovation Greenhouse, which uh, Commissioner Adams was very excited about. Um, uh, uh, Encompass. I mean, just a lot of programs that I would urge my colleagues to um, look at and visit if you have the opportunity this summer, which is coming up. Uh, we did meet on Tuesday. Um, we got an update on the three academic priority areas and the UPK vendor selection criteria process. There is a resolution in your packet that the committee is uh, advancing for approval. Um, resolution 2013-14, resolution number 695. Um, on the three academic uh, priorities, the presenters addressed the issues facing the district, improving student achievement and, prog and um, progression on those areas. The committee listened to district staff, present programming and initiatives to address the issues. And um, again, a copy of that presentation should be forwarded to you for your perusal. Um, some of the highlights were, these are things that you have heard before, but we got an update on them. Um, ending early dismissal Wednesdays, that has added tons of instruction time um, to the, to the um, district. 
um, the creation of the five expanded learning schools, um, initiatives to, re to reduce uh, sermon learning loss and expanding pre-K, um, new programs to ensure success include an innovation greenhouse, family reading outreach, additional horizons partnerships, school-based planning team, summer institute, the PBS kids in the classroom, and also um, family involvement. I jumped out of my seat when I heard the presentation from the UPK vendor selection process. It's a process that is much improved um, from last year's process, and I think that the board as well as the community and the community-based organizations will be very pleased with it. Um, the committee believes that the process was streamlined and it offered each vendor, they gave each vendor an opportunity and access to render UPK services to the district, so each vendor got a chance to present um, to um, the selection committee. Um, it was a new, it was, com it was a very competitive RFP process, and the um, process incorporated changes that were based on community feedback and recommendations that were expressed, as I mentioned, after the previous RF RFP. Um, the committee convened and initiated the process, and the process included applications um, followed by questions and answers to the committee. So it was a um, great process, Mr. President and colleagues, and I think that um, we, we are poised to continue the success that we've had in the UPK area. And I want to thank the um, selection committee that uh, made the selection and also the community partners that will be providing UPK services um, to, the, um, to, to, the, to, our, to the students in this district. As we know, that is a great um, equalizer for our young people. Our next uh, uh, meeting will be Tuesday, June 10th, um, immediately following the um, CIGR committee meeting. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Commissioner Evans. Uh, Commissioner Cruz. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my, my meeting, uh, the report is brief tonight. We met on May 15th and we looked at uh, two policies, a revision of parent and family engagement and the values education policy. Uh, with the regard to parent and family engagement, we made a couple minor revisions and it's in your packet tonight as an information item. Uh, the values education policy is a big undertaking. I really want to thank uh, Ms. Barbara Van Kirk and uh, Bill Benet. Uh, you know, Bill Benet has been a, fr a friend of this uh, district for many, many years. Uh, they have really come together and put together a program that I think is uh, useful uh, with regard to values education in the district. Uh, one of the things uh, we've done is to change the name. It's now called Civics Education. It's a little bit more encompassing. And um, we looked at a complete redesign of some of the content within the policy. We also uh, made it a little bit uh, user friendly. At, at one point, the original uh, document had some 49 different recommendations, and uh, Bill Benet has been able to sort of bring that down so it means a little bit more with regard to what we value in terms of education and civic responsibility here in this district. Um, and the next step is going to be the uh, working with staff to begin integrating that into the curriculum so that uh, we can begin asking questions like what is civic responsibility, what is civic engagement, what are our students expected to do with regard to getting involved, and uh, how does that happen. Uh, so uh, we look forward to that, the next uh, step in that uh, process. And uh, it is up. Uh, as I said, uh, it's up tonight as also as an information item as well. Uh, we did some tweaking on the uh, reports deliverables that we have uh, for the, for the uh, districts. We now have a chart, the calendar, of, uh, and uh, kudos to Ed Lopez and his staff uh, and, uh, and Deborah Flanagan who did a lot of research uh, when our reports are normally due. As you know, uh, we, our policies do mandate that we do get uh, feedback with regard to uh, different portions of the policies that we pass every year. You know, we've not been getting those regularly. Uh, we don't even know sometimes what reports are, are out there. So we now have a, a good uh, uh, handle on that. And uh, I've asked that that calendar be sent to all the committee chairs as well so that in the event that there is a particular committee chair that might have an interest in a particular report that they know it's coming up um, and will circulate reports as needed. We also included a, a new step. I think we mentioned at the last meeting, we were having reports come to the policy committee first as a, as a vetting, and then they're coming to the full board. So we'll get an opportunity uh, several times to look at those reports. Uh, and again, great, great work by the staff um, to, to put that together. 
Our next uh, committee meeting, assuming that we have some substantial agenda items, is going to be June the 12th. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Cruz. Commissioner Campos? Board Governor, sorry, I'm so sick. I can't breathe through my nose, so if I sound strange, that's why. I can, I can interpret I for know. you. I have Vicks Vapor Rub I've been using the whole time. <laughs> Jose's like, is that you? <laughs> oh, gosh, good times. So we met on May 15th, and uh, we focused on the agenda and objectives for the upcoming board retreat, proposed calendar of meetings for next year, or for, I should say, the 14-15 fiscal year. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and set performance review dates for the superintendent. Uh, for the next retreat, we're actually going to, because there was a lack of availability for um, the administrative team, administration, is to make this just with the board, uh, and the superintendent is part of the board. Uh, so just to make it just us, and we set the date for Saturday, June 14th. We did put a poll out there. So if you have not responded yet, please let me know. Let Sinead know. Again, it's June 14th. It'll be 8.30 till 12. It'll be back at my office um, on Scottsville Road. We're going to be focusing on um, trust, uh, focusing on different activities in order to talk about the varying philosophies of governance, really just to be able to have a good, healthy discussion as well as um, activities to discuss these things. So plan on that. If you can't make it, please let me know as soon as possible. We also reviewed the draft calendar, which everyone has. This year, it doesn't differ as much from uh, last year's, with the exception of ESA and CIGR meetings being held on the same night on the third Tuesday of every month. Um, and today, it's just presented for information only. So review it. If there's any changes, please just let us know. We'll make those changes uh, so we can adopt it next year. Uh, also, we discussed the continuous informal performance review, very informal conversations, I really just should say, with the superintendent. And we put some dates out there. Some are confirmed, some aren't. I will throw out the two dates that we have are July 31st and October 30th, which we're waiting for confirmation. But the key is, is that we want to be able to make, maintain consistency and always keep lines of communication open. And that concludes my report. We will not be meeting in June and will most likely conclude or uh, continue in July. And that concludes my report. Commissioner Campos, you're probably too young to remember this, but I know Bohan and Jose might. Uh, well, come on now. There was uh, a show called Laughing. And there was this woman who spoke with a like a snotty kind of nose and she couldn't. That's what you sound like. <laughs> what, what was her name? What was her name? You remember that? It wasn't real comedy. See, 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 see. You young folks know nothing about good comedy. I, I, you see the, you see Chip is smiling. He knows what I'm talking about. Hey, that's right. <laughs> they, <laughs> Ernestine, oh, that's your new nickname, uh, Commissioner Adams. Okay. Um, so moving on to the audit committee, some, something dry and thank you, Chip. Appreciate that. Informational. Um, the audit committee met on Tuesday, May 6th, with Freed Maxick, the board's external auditor, to review the audit plan for the financial audit for the year ending June 30th, 2014. The committee discussed the plan and reviewed the timelines for receiving the audit results. The audit will take place in the fall. The committee is planning, <clears throat> excuse me, to meet with Freed Maxick on Tuesday, December 3rd. So please everybody mark your calendars. That's one where we would really like the full board to attend. Uh, December 3rd at 5.30 p.m. to review the final results of the district financial audit. All board members are invited to attend. Um, the committee also received a status update on the work of the, audit, the Office of Auditor General. Um, so we um, reviewed status updates of ongoing um, work of the, of the Auditor General. This concludes my report. Um, briefly, point of personal privilege, um, I'd like to um, just say a couple words about an opportunity I had last week to attend the Western Regional Summit on Youth Justice, um, which is um, 
a continuation of some really important work that's being done by the Permanent Judicial Commission on Justice for Children, also known as the K Commission. Um, Judith K is a retired um, Chief Justice of New York State who has devoted, um, you know, really, really devoted her, her life's work now to um, addressing matters of exclusionary discipline, what, what a lot of us talk to as the cradle to school, the, uh, the cradle to prison or the school to prison pipeline, and really trying to address factors so that we can be more supportive in schools and keep children in school, um, you know, have that maximal instructional time that we talk about, but also just in terms of justice, in terms of not having our kids um, inadvertently or, you know, through processes that we have in schools funneled into the into either excessive suspensions or even worse arrests in the court system. So this was a very valuable all-day summit. There were many people from the administration. I was really happy to see Dr. G. Martino was there um, many, and others from, from the district. So it was good work done. And what's really hopeful and I'm really optimistic about is there's just energy bubbling up from everywhere. I know <clears throat> you've heard everyone in, on the board in various committees all year express our concern about excessive suspensions, about arrests, and so on. Um, but really, there is a bubbling up of energy in the community. I appreciate the superintendent's engagement. Had a really good session a couple months ago here, um, bringing community members together. And uh, you know, in follow up to the many of those people attended the summit. And in follow up to that, I know, like just in the up couple, upcoming weeks. On Friday, May 30th, there's going to be a collaborative between Teen Empowerment and Metro Justice doing organizing work looking at the code of conduct so that they can help advise um, us and the policy committee in particular regarding revisions of the code of conduct to really transform that so it has a different spirit and intent. Um, and then the following day, May 31st, I know many people already know um, the Facing Race Embracing Equity work that's been ongoing for over, over a year, right? A couple of years almost? Um, has, their, has a series of uh, working sessions where they're rolling up their sleeves and really committing to you know, project-based work and definitely will touch in some of those working groups on this work. And then finally, um, on June 6th, the Neighborhood Consortium for Youth Justice, which is an ongoing collaborative in my neighborhood over on the southwest side, I, many members of that, many members of President White's Special Committee on Safety um, school and community safety are part of that consortium, and they are very um, much interested in really doing work on this. So there's a lot of a lot of hope to really stem this and stop the school to prison pipeline. Thank you, Commissioner Adams. Uh, my report will be very brief. Um, obviously, uh, last month or this past month, we had a very successful budget process. Once again, um, thank you, Dr. Vargas and your team, I think uh, we gave them kudos last uh, time we met, but probably can't do that enough. That, that's a hard endeavor, and every year you've come through like a champ uh, in, in a way that no other superintendent has. We haven't had the disruption. So we really do appreciate that, and we can't uh, thank you and your team enough for that. Uh, we also uh, are, uh, will be in a position to thank you, I'm claiming the victory uh, to, for your work on East High School. Um, Long story short, we continue to work diligently on uh, satisfying the state's requirements. Uh, it's funny, I was on the phone with uh, uh, some colleagues in another district in New York State, and we were talking about EPOs, and I happened to mention to them that we got an extension. They said, hey, how did you get an extension? Uh, very, very difficult. We are very, very blessed to have an organization like the University of Rochester to step to the plate and put their credibility on the line. And uh, people told me that Joel Seligman was a guy who was a take no prisoners, get the job done kind of person. I had not personally spent any time with him before this, and uh, he is every that, everything and then some. Uh, he is, you know, Susan B. Anthony said, once said, uh, failure is not an option. Uh, that is a tenet that Joel Seligman lives by. We are not going to fail at East High School because we have the right partners and we have the right will and commitment here at this district. So I look forward to additional positive news in, on that front. Um, we, as a district, continue to work forward and, and be focused. Uh, we have fine-tuned our finish line reports. Of all the things that 
you don't hear about, I'm most excited about the finish line reports. And my colleagues, uh, you get copies of those reports, and they indicate school by school where we are at in terms of major benchmarks. And people who participated in those meetings Wednesday morning, we, we don't meet at the central office. We meet Wednesday mornings at the schools and have conversations about where they're at, where they were, where they're at, and where they're going. Uh, for you young folks out there uh, participating in government, this government is focused on results. And we have weekly conversations about why our schools are struggling and why some schools are making success. Uh, in terms of participating in government, students, you are looking at a government that is also aware that we must look way ahead. And so Dr. Vargas, I heard Commissioner Evans talk about it as well. We, we're preparing what we call a pipeline report. We want to know way in advance of getting into ourselves a situation like we did with East High School where the trouble might be. And so we're looking down that pipeline so that we make good decisions uh, by giving ourselves enough time. Um, in addition, you know, we, we uh, all of us to do uh, visit schools and talk to folks. And Dr. Parks and I were at uh, the children's school this morning, again, standing room only. It's very positive. Uh, you know, I, I got to be honest, I'm not. I never was too big into the school visits. Um, this is confession here. <laughs> uh, but uh, when, you, when you take the time, because I, I look at this job, uh, from my perspective, more globally, right? right? Uh, so it's easy to get caught up in that effort. But when you go to those schools, and you all know this, that when you go to those schools and you see those kids and you see those parents that are there and the staff people, it really re-energizes you and certainly energizes them. We, we happen to be in the company of uh, the mayor. Uh, and, and that brings up another point I wanted to make. Uh, we have partnerships of way above and beyond East High School. Uh, Lovely Warren and I talk regularly by text, by phone. That wasn't happening a couple administrations ago. Uh, and it's not an adversarial situation at all. Uh, today we met and talked at the children's school and I think a week from now we're going to have lunch with some kids at the zoo. So good government, by the way, young folks, happens when people collaborate and communicate. And uh, this government is attempting to do that. Um, I, I got to mention uh, good government exists because of good people. Um, you young folks back there, to your right, turn to the right, turn to the right. You see a young man sitting there. He's kind of chilling. He got a tie on. He's always looking sharp. That's Willie Robinson. Willie Robinson, that man, you want to learn about good government and engaging people in, in the, the business of government? Talk to him. I don't know how late he's going to be here, but you ought to talk to him. Because he put on an event uh, called, it's called Family Affair in the Park. Is that right, Willie? Let's give Willie a round of applause. They had. And I, I remember back in the day when they would do these Title I conferences, they might get on a good day at the Radisson or whatever, about 300, 350 people. Um, last year, I think they got 2,000. This year, they had 3,000 registrants. Now, Malik will tell you, because he was out there with me, and, and Bohan was, it was cold. It was cold. It wasn't raining, but oh, Ray was out there. A lot of you are out there. It was cold. But people still came out, and they turned out, I think, about 2,100 people. Um, so kudos to Willie uh, for uh, having another successful year where people learned about their government and how parents could be engaged in that government. Uh, and it was a wonderful event. Um, and at another time, Malik will tell you how he picked out on cheeseburger, cheeseburger. <laughs> um, finally, uh, finally, I want you all to know that um, we uh, continue to work uh, at uh, making government more accessible and more real to folks. So I want, in, in this regard, I want to thank Commissioner Campos, uh, who is the third person to host our commissioner's uh, cookies and conversation. People often were very frustrated that they come in, they make statements, and then we would just look at them and not say anything. So we t decided to give ourselves a little time with folks in advance, a half an hour before the actual meeting begins. And Commissioner Campos uh, hosted. She was playing some serious songs. We, we actually asked the commissioners to come up with a playlist. I, when I came in, she was already hosting, and she was playing the song Happy. And then the next song on her Ain't playlist, no yeah, Marvin Gaye. She was jamming with some Marvin Gaye. So please get the word out that uh, before our board meetings, we, we talk to folks. Um, and if you have questions or concerns, 
you can address them at that time. I should also tell you that Commissioner Campos is going to post in what we are calling Commissioner Corner, uh, her pet issue, which is student wellness. She's going to post an essay. If you go to the website, just look under Commissioner's Corner, you'll see an essay from um, uh, Commissioner Campos. Commissioner Evans has already done one. Uh, Commissioner Adams has already done one. And uh, I did one as well. So um, that concludes my report. And uh, anybody want to ask any questions? I just have one quick. Yes. Uh, I wasn't going to say anything, but just the fact that my whole piece is on wellness this month, and we've got, I'm sick today, as well as it's commissioners and cookies, so I think we might be in violation of our yes, own wellness right. policy. Not going to lie. Well, Not going to lie. She, she's been doing this. Commissioners and carrots. I like <laughs> No. Eh. That is not going to work. I'm going to see That is not. That, that, now, now, wait a second. Don't go overboard. But she's been doing this for a while because if you go downstairs, I don't even like going downstairs anymore because it's like all this healthy food. Bill, you know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? So, all right. Back to the business of good government. Government does laugh every now and then because otherwise you'll go crazy if you don't. So. All right, um, we're not going to have a, a parent, uh, a student report. Um, I see our student is not here. I was also told by Willie that um, Makita was not able to come tonight, other obligations. This is probably the first time Makita has not been here in a long time. I just saw her at a meeting a couple days ago. Makita, for those of you who don't know, is she's the chair of our parent advisory council, so we won't get a report from them tonight. Uh, now on to the consideration of resolutions, unless there's any other comments or concerns about uh, the reports. All right, oh, let's, Mr. Perry, yes. Just, just um, if you don't mind a point of sure. personal privilege, the yep. um, coming up uh, June, first weekend of June is uh, another New York State School Board Association Board of Directors meeting uh, this coming sat or the first Saturday of June. If there's any, uh, anything that we'd like to carry to NISBA as part of our Big Five report, I'd be happy to convey that. Anybody have had any ideas or suggestions, um, uh, please contact Commissioner Powell. Thank you. Um, and by the way, Commissioner Powell and I traveled to Albany. Was that last that was weekend? Fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. So, um, consideration resolutions. Let's begin with resolution 637 to 658. Can I get a motion? Second. Uh, any discussion? 637. Six. Thank you very much, Mr. Campos. Uh, so let's uh, amend that motion a bit for 638 to 658. Commissioner Evans, you make a motion to discuss those? Yeah. Uh, and there's a second. Yes. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, let's move on to resolution 659 to 665. Is there a second? Second. All those in, any discussion? All those in favor? All right. Uh, let's move on. Can we get a resolution for uh, to discuss 666 to 660, 673? As a second. Second. All those. Uh, any discussion? No, I would just note that those all went through finance. So. Any uh, discussion? Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 And finally, are there others? Resolution 674. Through. Mm -hmm. Any? Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? I guess. Six seventy-four through six ninety-five. Commissioner Cruz didn't let me finish, but we knew where we were going, right, Commissioner Cruz? The, the only thing I would say, Mr. President, yes. is that uh, several of these resolutions are related to our uh, expanded um, uh, learning in the summer program that I referenced in my report. And um, so, so that's good stuff for our students this summer. We're going to have thousands of kids in. in um, summer opportunities this summer, so the school year really is not ending. They're getting tortured the way I was when I was a kid. They get to <laughs> still focus on education over the summer, so very happy about that. And I, I was, uh, there's a lot of good programming, you're absolutely right, but I was especially glad to see uh, Freedom School get a second summer, so thank you very much, uh, uh, Superintendent Vargas. Uh, all those in favor of, uh, uh, oops, yes, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I have um, a couple of quick questions. With 687 yes, regarding the ramp up for PTEC. I know I've asked a lot of questions and expressed some concerns about PTEC, but I, I do support, I am fully supportive <coughs> of PTEC going forward. Um, one thing I want to address though is the funding for that because my understanding was that it was 
pretty much a self-contained grant funded program that there was a state grant to fund it and this is using different resources and I noticed that I think it's including a few other students going into ninth grade at STEM in addition to the IT P-TECH students but still um, you know is that I just want to make sure that because this is not P-TECH state grant funding that we're approving here so I don't so, know if there's um, okay, Rena, you mind giving some clarification? the grant fund that is used for this uh, program is the stem uh, 1003A Title I set aside that focuses on increasing STEM education opportunities in partnership with higher education institutions. Um, the PTEC grant itself uh, is a June 30th end date for year one, and therefore the next grant has not been received. Uh, the next round has not been authorized for use yet. So, is there any chance that? When it is authorized, we'll be able to use PTEC funding to support the PTEC students in that summer. Yes, um, although yeah. this this set aside specifically is for STEM and higher education, and there's enough in this fund to cover for this year. Okay, thanks. And then um, my other question has to do with 688, and it's probably a more of a facilities type question because this is the one that's shifting the use of. 690 St. Paul, I guess different floors are being used because our um, plans for where we need to locate students has recently changed. So that just raises some questions that I have actually pending about where, one, one question is where are the seventh and eighth graders from school 29, school two, and school 44, where are they intended to go? And then also um, what is happening with the School Without Walls Foundation building on North Clinton? And finally, in the context of this shifting, I know that we've all heard a lot of concerns about the Leadership Academy for Young Men um, being located, being co-located in a building with girls, and that that's creating serious problems for their integrity of their program. So three sort of space questions that got raised for me when I heard that we had shifting plans for um, 120, uh, 690 St. Paul. Um, my answer to the question about the student of those various schools, where they're going to go, 29. Can you come to the podium, please? Mike, can you come in to answer a couple of questions about facilities, please? And then Ed, I'm going to need you to explain the, uh, the situation with 690 some poor lists. So, Go ahead, Beverly, first answer the question, please, where the student from 29, what, what was the three school that you mentioned? The, the ones that have pulled back from K-8 to K-6. The seventh and eighth grade classes, yes. 29, two, school and number two, and school 44. So what happened uh, when we decided that we would um, uh, no longer continue with the seventh and eighth grade, working with uh, Chief um, Vicki Ramos. Uh, the chiefs and the principals held meetings with the parents, invited them to a meeting, placement attended, and a letter went out as well to the parents where parents were given choices about where they, could, they would want their son or daughters to attend school. So there isn't any specific school that we sent those students to. Parents had choices in other places where there are seventh and eighth grade programs. That's really concerning because when we had the situation with school 16, which was one school that had a late late year change of, you know, not being open for that community. Yes. There were a lot of people who did not get word and didn't know or people who just for whatever reason didn't didn't follow the placement. They weren't aggressive and assertive about placing their kids. There was a lot of angst about that. So do you have a sense of how many of those seventh and eighth graders from those three schools have made choices to date? I believe all students have been assigned. We can get that information from uh, Vicki Ramos. Each school was assigned and in the letter noted who their um, placement coordinator would be. And oh, so they were assigned to specific schools? No, the, the families were assigned a coordinator from placement who would who would work with them student to student, yes. 
but they were not assigned to a particular school. They were given a choice to attend another school where there was a seventh or eighth grade program. And that notification went out like a month ago? Is that about the? Oh, probably a little more than a month ago. More yes, than a month ago? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so if we could request that information, how many students have chosen, actively chosen, where they will attend? Okay. That would be We'd important. be happy to do that. And then the other question was, what's going on with the School Without Wells Foundation building? Uh, and... Uh, um, Let me take it one by one. So thank okay. you, Mrs. Moore. Yep, thank you. Um, Michael, please. Uh, no, we're talking about the uh, Clinton, Clinton Avenue, Avenue downtown. It used to be the Clinton Avenue Learning Center. Or, or, and or who's going into, if, like what's, what caused the displacement that resulted in a new resolution this month? The, the, in regards to the, the Martin Street facility, we, made, we, we had to make the accommodation with the possibility of, of uh, alternate plans for the 7th uh, and 8th grade East Foundation students that um, we wanted to, if, if they were going to stay in that building, we need to make accommodations in the second floor. So Mr. Suriano, Director of Special Education, and myself uh, worked on an arrangement, work are, are working currently on a plan, implementing a plan where the, uh, the office space on the second floor will be reallocated in uh, spaces throughout the district and that the um, uh, Rochester Prep or Uncommon Schools will then secure space on the second floor. So the resolution really is just um, relocating what was currently, what was first described as the third floor, now to the second floor. The space is basically um, very similar in terms of the, of the makeup. So um, it does give us some flexibility, no matter what their final determination in regards to the East is. Um, but that, like I said, having those, having those professionals in another location then gives us more, op more options going forward. So and just real, real yes, quick, facilities-wise, East is ready to receive the seventh and eighth graders back in the fall. It's, so it's the programmatic the, question. Yes, the project will be completed, but like okay. I said, we're still waiting for a determination from uh, going forward in regards to what the uh, actual configuration will be. But the project will be finished. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, maybe President White and I can give you an update. Uh, we heard, and it's well documented, that the East Side uh, community wanted to not to return the, the student to as, a, as part of the night 12 so we didn't know what the University of Rochester might propose so I felt that that no felt that it's a conviction that I have that you don't move K around it's, the research is very clear if you could avoid that you do that but um, um, we heard that the uh, potentially the U of R is interesting in a seven no potential we heard very firm seven to uh, nine, which is a little different than what we heard from the parents and all the community. So it's sort of like in this question mark, here's what I heard. I think you confirmed that. Uh, however, I totally subscribe to the whole notion that the U of R believe that if you get children or oh, youngster that needs uh, increased their math and reading skill, that you rather get, have six years with them than, let's say, four. And you just have to have the right program and the right approach to, to help them. So uh, when we heard that, that's one of the conditions that I heard. Uh, so I immediately began to work in the event that they desired to have the kid back uh, east in, 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 uh, in September, we'd be able to deliver that. And that's uh, a plan that is supposed to come up pretty soon, uh, July um, 1st, if you're not no mistaken. So m we're meeting tomorrow and next week to talk about the logistic and, and the type of preparation that the district had to have to uh, support some of the effort that the U of R is taking. As a result, that triggered a lot of stuff, and I asked uh, your general counsel, El Lopez, and maybe you can come in and explain it. So there is some technicality going on and being proactive rather than reactive uh, in the event that we're in a position that the U of R want those get back. So I think you've done a very nice job already of explaining what's going on. Basically, as both you and um, the president know that, is the U of R came in a couple of days ago and expressed a great interest in changing the landscape once again at East High. 
about um, a month ago when we had the public hearings, we listened to parents, staff, and the principal at East High all tell us that maybe they should be separated for the imminent future. But um, at this last meeting, the um, U of R expressed interest and in fact said that it was a condition that we bring the schools back together because they wanted a comprehensive plan. And as you both stated before, it's really important because they said that so many of these kids fall behind. And if they're coming into the ninth grade, they need them in the seventh and eighth grade to prepare them for the ninth grade as they envision the school to be in the future. Well, given that we had spent, I'll be honest, hundreds of hours with Uncommon Schools, with our facilities people, and others planning for East High to stay and reconfiguring the space there, we had to go back again <laughs> and start doing the reconfiguring again. So the resolution you got today is um, nuanced so that it gives us flexibility to actually go back and change things to the way they were going to be once again should we tomorrow decide together to bring East High, 7th and 8th graders back to East High. In spite of the environment here that we're constantly reacting by forces that are outside our control, but anytime you're trying to be responsive, I mean, you can, I could have reacted, I say, well, you know, it's, uh, my staff have put so much work with listening, but I think that in the spirit of collaboration, we're doing the right things. And thank you to the staff, to Michael and Beverly and Patty and Ed and Bethany and Chip and Amy and everybody and Ray, because this is no small task. Um, these people, are, our folks are working 14 and 17 hours a day actually to be, I want to be for the record to go on the record that um, the managing team is uh, I'm concerned about burnout and going, I, hopefully they can take some vacation. Norway, very soon. Okay, Thanks. guys. All right. Um, we have and to Carolina, too. Oh, uh, there were two more oh, questions. Sorry, the, the, um, status <laughs> of the school at Wells Foundation. Building, the, the use for that, what's intended to be used, and then also a comment on the Leadership Academy for Young Men and their co-location in a school of girls. I didn't realize until recently what an issue it is and that really it does sound like the integrity of the program is challenged and we put a lot of resources in there up front, a lot of fanfare, a lot of dedication and commitment, brought in people from the outside and then if there's a technical matter that we're, that could potentially be sabotaging this program. It's not a program, it's a school and it's what we have suffered for a long time, Commissioner Adam. That school was designed in the FMP to be co-located with a co-ed school. That was by design. That wasn't something that we made a mistake. We designed it that way. Actually, Charla was supposed to have two schools in that building, and that is in the original FMP that I began to execute. And if you want to see the record, I will show you, but that school never was intended to have uh, their own building. Now, President Evans will tell you from they, that's where they were born three years ago, okay? And uh, that was the uh, plan that was intended. However, that doesn't, I won't tell you that that's the correct way to do it, that we had to find a building, but we have so many moving parts in this district right now. Part of the moving part is the FMP. If you're gonna, um, you've seen that we have moving school 58, for example, it's been two years we are building with school 28. Uh, we have a lot of mobility, so if it were with not having the FMP, tomorrow we can come with a plan and, and probably find a house, but we need the swing space, and we also need to find the best space, not to mention what President White was saying, looking at that pipeline, uh, that we had to look what potential situation that you have. Um, and I just be very firm, there might be a situation where you might have to close the school. I don't know what that situation is right now, but I just want to be very clear. No one wants that. I never met a superintendent or a board member that wanted to come to a community and say you had to close the school. 
but there are situations in here that we're going to have to use whatever tool we have available. So it's a question of time, and what I ask the board is to understand that all the moving part, and also why it's so important to plan well. Because when you don't plan well, the same thing with school number, uh, the school two, school 29, and the school 44. The K-8 is something that we are, and thank you to the board, we are working on it, that we are fixing a, a, a challenge that we encountered. And it doesn't mean that it was a bad idea to, to get to K-8, that's not what I'm saying, it's just that you, you encounter certain situations that you had to manage. And let me tell you that I don't know any superintendent or board that like to be dealing with so many moving parts. I, I would stop by say 35 buildings were moving for one reason or another around uh, three years ago. My hope is that we reduce that very soon. Uh, Mike, will you please uh, uh, finally address the facility in Clinton Avenue? In regards to the uh, Clinton Avenue facility, the former School Without Walls Foundation, uh, right now that we are working with Senior Cabin in regards to looking at a variety of options for, for next year with a number of different pieces that Dr. Vargas has laid out, um, I think for us right now having some flexibility is probably our greatest asset in a sense with so many different uh, moving parts. So there isn't anything definitive that I can report to you this evening except that um, it is uh, at the forefront of our uh, of our conversations for a variety of different uh, different areas and uh, having that actual space as an option gives us more as I, as I said more flexibility when we were talking about re relocating uh, the, the special education offices that was one of the areas that we, we considered so it's just a variety of pieces I think we'll have some more clarity on it within uh, the next four or five weeks so will it be occupied by students in the fall I, my answer would really there's stay the no same. Plan I, I, was, I was going to say, I think that's where we're there's at right no now. There's no plan, but something could happen. One of the things that we discussed was some East High School student put in there. We also discussed you know, all the services that could come. Um, we constantly, and Mike will tell you, that uh, there are things that do occur with this FMP that we're constantly trying to find a space. For example, just give. I have a school 12, they don't want to go into, um, into, uh, the, into Jefferson. I, I understand, I, and I what understand. I'm, the, I just want to, what I'm trying, if you don't understand, please allow me to answer the question because I think it's extremely important, your question, because it's, it's benefit even for me and for the board to explain that, that um, the FMP is forcing us to what is called swing space, and we're constantly finding, um, challenges that is desirable to have the building right now, and that's why we haven't reached a decision to say, here's what we're doing with this building. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All those in favor of uh, passing resolution 674 to 695, say aye. 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 I have to abstain to 685. And I abstain on uh, uh, 685. Madam Clerk, you caught those? Okay. All right. Unfinished business. There is none. New business. Uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Vargas. Uh, Commissioner. Commissioner Cruz. I'm tired. Uh, Commissioner Cruz, uh, any discussion on these particular policy matters? No, no. We've talked about them before. Any other comments on uh, these particular policy matters from any other board member? Just very, very quickly, I submitted yes, some recommendations for discussion on the um, policy 5500 regarding student records, which I will I will try to attend the policy committee meeting, and I've submitted it in writing. Okay. It, it takes advantage of um, state legislation that came along with the budget, which gives local districts the option to not um, share personally identified student information with these big shared infrastructures, which was something that was discussed as being desirable a year ago in finance, but at that point, the state was insisting that it was not optional, but now it is optional. So I'm suggesting that we take advantage of that and protect our students' privacy. Thank you. Mr. President, I'd like, yes. to, I'd like to thank Mary for her attention to that detail. Um, it didn't come up when we were discussing the policy and committee, and because this time is simply to discuss the policy proposal, 
doesn't require an action on our part to withdraw it or anything, but I would look forward to having more discussion about it in the committee and with, with the potential of retracting it and, and reworking that policy uh, before advancing it for, for a vote. Um, well, thank everybody for their diligence on that. Uh, speakers on anything other than agenda item, we've already taken care of that. Uh, our next meeting is June the 19th. I also want to tell folks that the Latino Job Fair, I think it's June the 14th, so you might want to mark your calendars for that. Uh, I did get a number for the uh, Edison Cafeteria. I know people are, hopefully are still watching. They're open from 7 to 2 uh, p.m. Monday through Friday. Their telephone number is 775. This is a free commercial. 775-6565. And they got a lot more than just sweet potato pie. Support them, please. Um, uh, again, our next business meeting is June the 19th, 2014. If you want to know anything else about the board, you can go onto our website, www.rcsdk12.org. Uh, we uh, are about to, can I get a motion to go into executive session? We have one resolution to talk about in executive session. So move reluctantly. Okay, and uh, folks, you should know we are going to adjourn uh, from downstairs. So if you're interested, you've got to go downstairs, second floor.